very happy to have you here uh, today with us. Um, and thanks for making the time out of your busy day. Uh, just a little short bio today. The title of the talk is T uh, Type 1 Diabetes and Nutrition, Cur Current Developments and Research Gaps. Just a short bio. Uh, oops, on my own. I have my own issue here. Uh, Dr. Uh, Andrew Kutnick is a research scientist at Sansum Diabetes Research Institute and a visiting research scientist at the Institute for Human and Machine Cognition. Dr. Kutnick holds degrees in exercise physiology from Florida State University and biomedical sciences from University of South Florida. Um, oh, Moran Schools of College of Medicine. Dr. Kutnick is actively investigating the role of therapeutic um, culturally tailored lifestyle interventions and carbohydrate restriction in both diabetes management and prevention, as well as exploring therapeutic options that regulate the multi-system impacts of glycemia and hyperglycemia. Personally, Andrew Kutnick has lived with type 1 diabetes for over 14 years. Type 1 diabetes has and continues to give an incredible in-depth personal journey into the world of our metabolism, how it works, how day-to-day -day life, sometimes moment-by-moment -moment choices, influences it and how changes um, in metabolism can have far-reaching effects over other aspects of our physiology. He lives in Santa Barbara, California with his wife and family. Um, thanks so much again for joining us and um, you know, feel free to take it away here. Well, Monica, I truly appreciate that. And it is, it is really, really cool to be here. Um, frankly, an honor to be here uh, uh, with a platform that focuses on uh, diabetes, specifically with a focus on type 1 diabetes. Um, I am a research scientist at Samsung Diabetes Research Institute, but more important than any of that, I'm, I'm a patient living with type 1 diabetes, and, and this is obviously a very personal topic for me, and one that I, I think uh, it is of interest to a lot of people, uh, which I'll describe here in the, the talk here in a moment. But the title of today's talk is Type 1 Diabetes Nutrition. Now, this is a, a very controversial topic in type 1 diabetes, um, although it's one of the key pillars of health. Uh, it, it's often um, underappreciated, I think, in this domain, or maybe under research, and we'll kind of walk through that, looking at um, current research, but also research gaps. I uh, also want to provide my disclosures. So uh, the outline of today's talk is uh, first focusing on type 1 diabetes. Many in the audience are very familiar with this, but just focusing on the key components of the why we want to even consider food uh, as a, a potential uh, area of focus in the context of type 1 diabetes. Also looking at food, specifically with emergent insights from randomized controlled trials, uh, how food interacts with glycemic uh, control, and ultimately look at history of food and nutrition research, uh, both from the past over 100 years ago all the way till now, and then uh, really hone in on the key focus of this talk, uh, which is the gaps and how we move forward with those gaps. So. When talking about type 1 diabetes, many in the audience are very familiar with these topics, so I'll, I'll glance over this, but uh, in 2021, it was estimated that 8.4 million people live with this disease, ultimately a disease defined by the autoimmune uh, destruction of the pancreatic or insulin-producing pancreatic beta cells. The loss of this function within the body ultimately results in uh, having to take exogenous insulin, but uh, at, basically the, at its core, the the lack of insulin production endogenously results in elevated and variable uh, glycemic control despite exogenous insulin administration, ultimately exposing the body to more or higher or more variable glucose levels, which ultimately increases HbA1c, a, a long-term measure of glycemic control over an estimated two to three month period of time. Now, uh, there was a hallmark paper looking at glycemic control in the United States from a group, the type 1 diabetes exchange group, which is a cluster of some of the uh, who's who in clinical care research yeah. uh, in their patient population. And one thing that they found is that uh, in this paper published by Foster et al. in 2019, that from 2010 all the way till 2018, there was a, uh, an, a, a rather robust finding of a regression in glycemic control. Now, why this really... Uh, Besides the fact that it was a deterioration in glycemic control, what really sparked people's uh, interest in this topic was also the fact that it was despite increased use in technology across the entire population. Now, there was a more recent investigation uh, from a similar group, although now it's called a Type 1 Diabetes Exchange Quality Improvement Collaborative, a much larger group of hospitals. Uh, they look at outskirt hospitals for underserved populations. 
uh, with a much larger end value. And what they found is that when also looking from 2016 to 2022, there was a significant increase or improvement in HbA1c. Although when we compare these values historically to one another, compare uh, from prior analysis, it does not. At least we know that one glycemic control is not deteriorating anymore, which is a positive improvement. But it doesn't seem to be markedly improving uh, historically speaking. Now this is despite increased technology use. So going from a third of the population using CGMs to over three fourths, increased pump use. And ultimately, uh, going from 0% penetrance of hybrid closed loop technology to 33%. But why, why would we even care about this in, in, with type 1 diabetes unless it had some type of implication? We know that in the context of type 1 diabetes, in the absence of uh, pancreatic beta cell or insulin-producing pancreatic beta cells, we know that this results in elevated HbA1c and, and ultimately higher, more variable glucose levels. But this also has implications across tissue systems. Uh, this includes uh, the brain. We know there's neuroanatomical changes, changes in cognition. Uh, some of the symptoms of hypo and hyperglycemia are related to mental psychological status and ultimately hyperglycemia. We know that there are also complications related to this disease, both on microvascular and macrovascular disease, including things on growth, uh, autoimmunity, and also uh, deconditioning or the idea of uh, people with type 1 diabetes related to elevated HbA1c, or at least it appears it might be, there are some changes in uh, exercise capacity over time through measurements of things like VO2 max. Now, this is something that appears to be common phenomenon across the type 1 diabetes population. It also appears to be cumulative. So the effect on glucose control throughout the lifespan appears to matter. And it also, from DCC and EDIC data, one of the largest trials ever conducted, if not the largest trial, I believe it is, in type 1 diabetes history illustrates that this, these effects might not be completely reversible, which is important, right? It, it places a focus on improving this metric uh, as it relates to many of these uh, tissue-specific outcomes. But the focus of today's talk isn't so much a background on type 1 diabetes, but more so just making the case for why, why would we care about food? Uh, what role does diet really have in this disease, if at all? Well, I believe that there's some important insights we can actually look at at some of the most rigorously conducted randomized controlled trials of closed loop or hybrid closed loop technology uh, published from 2018 all the way till last year. And in all these trials, one thing is very interesting when actually looking at glycemic control. Now, the top two graphs are mean glucose values and the bottom two graphs are time and range. It's a different way of looking at glucose control. And one thing that really sticks out is that when looking at the, these technologies and when they appear to work best, it's during this very closed window of time when patients typically aren't eating food. Now, the other period of time when patients are eating food, uh, it seems to have only a subtle, if, if at all, mean, questionable impact uh, during the day. Now, one may say, okay, um, there's other factors during the day beyond food, like exercise, stress, circadian biology, that play a role. And these certainly do play an important role. But to highlight this point, um, we know that there are direct impacts of various components of the food and type 1 diabetes. And this is just an illustration of, of these key macronutrient components, uh, fat, protein, and carbohydrates, which all appear to have different glycemic impacts and ultimately insulin impact or insulin requirements within the body. Carbohydrates obviously sits atop that as it's the it's more rapidly digestible and has a more potent impact per gram on glucose control. But when we really talk about type 1 diabetes, we're really talking about a consideration of what happens if you don't have insulin on board. These, these levels are even higher uh, and stay prolonged in the absence of insulin. But nonetheless, when thinking about these prior trials and also contextualizing them, we know that acute carbohydrate impact or acute carbohydrate intake is the most potent lifestyle factor on postprandial hyperglycemic or post, basically post-food intake glycemic control. We also know that insulin administration is the most potent lifestyle factor in hypoglycemia, and there's a clear direct relationship between the amount of carbohydrates consumed and postprandial blood glucose control, as well as carbohydrate content and the required amount of insulin at each meal. So we know that 
ultimately carbohydrates clearly have a potent, if not the most potent impact, uh, at least in acute control around meals. But there's also evidence uh, from some observational analysis uh, in over 300 uh, subjects who underwent what many would consider uh, a very unique diet, which is a very low carbohydrate diet where patients restricted carbohydrate intake to less than 50 grams per day, 42% of which were children. Uh, actually, this is doctor confirmed data. So the researchers actually reached out to the patient's um, physicians to confirm uh, the HbA1c and other metrics like insulin, CGM, and glycemic control. And what this data illustrated in this publication was that these were glycemic control that was unmatched by any other therapeutic intervention currently available to patients with type 1 diabetes outside of islet cell and beta cell transplant therapy, as these patients on average achieved a non-diabetic or, or normal glycemic HbA1c of 5.67%, so less than the 57 threshold. And also Andrew, had remarkable wanted, uh, oh Andrew, I just wanted yep. to highlight that this was um this publication was put out there by Dr. Richard Bernstein and also RD Dykeman. Um Richard Bernstein is, you know, he's he's a proponent of a certain uh, management style of uh, type 1 diabetes and RD Dykeman and others are participants in a group called um type 1 grit and let me be 83 yep. where they're very much um you know, um, following a, uh, and their 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 children are following a low carb diet. So it's very interesting that this group, um, you know, uh, a community based group, went ahead and pushed forward um, with scientific data to support their hypothesis. It's quite interesting. Yeah, and it is interesting outcomes for sure. And this is a very motivated uh, group, but it also had community support. There are other factors that ultimately could play into why these results may or may not have been uh, what they are. Uh, but it's also important to appreciate, uh, and this it's important. I appreciate that context, Monica, because we'll dive into this a bit more on um, where we stand in the research, because this was ultimately an a doctor confirmed observational analysis. Yeah. But a lot of times people, really want the, the highest grade of evidence in science, which ultimately dictates and shifts uh, guidelines, are randomized controlled trials, specifically long-term randomized controlled trials. And I'll give a bit more context on where we stand on topics like this uh, related to uh, randomized controlled trials or other uh, more rigorous evidence on this topic. One thing I wanted to just so, also share is yep. that that group um, Dr. Bernstein and his, you know, um, and people who follow his uh, recommendations, uh, they do use our insulin um, and they use um, shots over pumps, but they do use CGM. So it's kind of, it's just, that's an, also an interesting observation. Yes. And, and, it's and it is important and this you almost like set me up Monica this is perfect <laughs> uh, because there are every uh, it is important to appreciate that any specific dietary intervention um ultimately requires therapeutic adjustments right this in the context of insulin requirements even the type of insulin uh this requires education both from the patient but also the physician who's helping guide the patient through this journey mm -hmm. uh, and and that's really critical and i'll talk about some data along that context and why i feel this is such an important area of research um going forward to address some of these key gaps as you kind of uh, alluded to and actually spoke to some of the um constraints of of this study specifically but also uh this is actually a, a field-wide thing uh which i'll kind of dive into yeah, so right. there is obviously yeah. There's also evidence. Uh, illustr so uh, we know that type 1 diabetes at its core is a, a disease with um, uh, around glycemic management, uh, the loss of insulin function, and ultimately using all the tools and tricks we have in the bag, so to speak, uh, to ultimately improve uh, glycemic control uh, throughout the day. Now, glycemic control isn't the only thing, but well, the one that predicts uh, most of the major acute and chronic complications. So it's a big focus in this field. Uh, and some of the emergent evidence, just some of which I illustrated here, illustrates that food could potentially play a massive role uh, or be a powerful tool in the context of type 1 diabetes. But I would argue that we're actually lacking research in this domain. And this is actually a publication from a publication that myself and uh, Belinda Leonards and some other colleagues actually worked on, looking at the history around the focus on medical nutrition therapy, not only from a research perspective, but also clinical uh, emphasis. 
and, and also in the context of pharmacological and technological interventions. And what you see pretty clearly down in the green uh, shading is that over time, since the discovery of insulin in the 19, early 1920s, there has been a deprioritization or de-emphasis of the use of medical nutrition therapy and a growing emphasis the use of uh, pharmacotherapy and also technology. Now, there's good reason for that because there's tremendous hope placed into those uh, areas. Um, but it, it's, it's also important to illustrate that some of the emergent data, despite increased technology use, um, and also uh, that glycemic control seems to be relatively stabilized, and also the emergent evidence, albeit not uh, gold standard randomized long-term uh, controlled trials, illustrates there might be a lot of hope uh, with these tools. Now, this, this emphasis around, or the shifting emphasis, can also be illustrated just looking on PubMed, searching things like the term technology and also requiring the, uh, also the use of the term type 1 diabetes, you see this almost exponential rise and the amount of publications that have happened essentially over the last two decades. But in 2023, there were 732 publications published just with the, the term technology and the term type 1 diabetes, either in the title or the abstract. Now, when we actually do a similar search in the context of diet in type 1 diabetes, you don't see this exponential climb. In fact, you actually see more of a, a plateauing with a subtle increase, almost like a step up uh, without any consistent uh, rise in interest. And that fact, when you look at 2023, the amount of cited papers on the term diet and type 1 diabetes on PubMed is only 165, which is four point times less uh, than when considering technology. So this is uh, obviously important, but there's even greater context to this that I want to kind of hone in on here. And that's actually the popularity around diet from a general public interest. Uh, this search I conducted, um, uh, uh, not it wasn't done today, but it was uh, a little a few months back. And when you actually look at a uh, Google Trends. Now, Google Trends gathers data on what has been searched on the internet uh, related to a specific term. And in this context, if you use the term type 1 diabetes as a disease, and you set the guidelines to look at worldwide interest over the past five years, what you can see is that one of the fastest rising terms over that period of time worldwide is actually a diet or, or terms related to diet, whereas two, three, and four were IDC codes, you know, healthcare codes. This really in, illustrates that there's a rising public interest in diet related to type one diabetes, and there's also cited increased use. So Monica, you brought up uh, some of the community groups. We also know that the number of users or the number of individuals who have joined and participated in these groups is, is on a precipitous rise uh, as well. And that really brings up this idea of, okay, well, if glycemic control appears to remain largely unmoved despite advanced technology and pharmacology, uh, at a general population level. And nutrition uh, appears to be the, well, is the most important factor, the component of nutrition, specifically carbohydrates and postprandial glycemic control. And this, the deprioritization around nutrition, despite a clear uptick over the last five years in public interest, we're kind of left unprepared to provide evidence-based guidelines or directions on which diet or food to actually implement in type 1 diabetes. So it, it leaves a little bit of confusion here. And this ultimately opens up uh, the topic around the gaps or the path forward. What is that? Uh, or at least I will make the case from my own subjective opinion where, where we might want to go and why. Number one is one of the clear gaps is that their historical carbohydrate intake has not been objectively defined. And there's a real lack of consensus uh, around defining uh, things around categorization of diet, such as carbohydrate intake. When we published a manuscript in JCI in 2021, uh, this is also with Belinda Leonard's, looking at various uh, carbohydrate uh, categories, we see that the top three categories, high carb, moderate carb, and low carb, these were largely defined based on general population intake norms. They weren't objectively defined, and they weren't defined specifically for type 1 diabetes or, frankly, type 2, or sorry, type 1 diabetes or even type 2 diabetes. Whereas these other diets on the lower end actually are based on a physiologic state, objectively defined and very popular. Um, but it's more important to appreciate on this slide, not so much the separation of these diets, but more so that they weren't 
they were defined based on uh, unobjective terms um, and recommendations were placed upon that despite them not actually being tested for their safety, efficacy, or effectiveness in the type 1 diabetes population. On top of that, there's also limited studies comparing things like carbohydrate intake uh, for safety, efficacy, and acceptability as discussed. And in an effort to actually address that, uh, myself and a team of uh, researchers from Boston Children's, Wash U, Queens University, tried to actually systemically pull every single study ever conducted in people living with type 1 diabetes with a reported carbohydrate content uh, uh, in the actual manuscript or report with clear surrogate outcome biomarkers associated with time on diet. Now, this pulled 101 publications, 151 cohorts on a specific diet, over 46,000 people, uh, people living with type 1 diabetes on various biomarkers related to clinical outcomes uh, of either, uh, uh, either efficacy, safety, uh, or effectiveness. And this is across glycemic control, insulin, lipids, body mass, adverse events, and beyond. Now, this analysis is not complete uh, as far as all the analysis. We're at the tail end of actually analyzing all components of this. But I want to share some things that were very clear when, when conducting this meta-analysis. Number one is that when you look at these various categories of diet, and we did it based on prior non-consensus definitions that were have put out there previously, that many of these randomized controlled trials in these different categories are actually pretty short in duration, less than three months on average, with only two out of 18 of the randomized controlled trials on the high carb end being greater than three months, and only four randomized controlled trials in the low carbohydrate uh, uh, diet category, zero of which were over three months. Another important component is while this diet on the very low end um, as seen as controversial by many, although there's an increased public interest and in, in clearly uh, increased incidence and in use that has been cited in patients, there are zero randomized controlled trials greater than seven days on this diet of, of less than or equal to 50 carbohydrates per day. Um, there is one trial that's seven days that's randomized uh, of 50 carbohydrates per day. So there's a clear research gap here. Um, looking at previously explored, and most of these randomized controlled trials actually explore other components of diet, things like fiber intake, shifting, let's say, polyunsaturated fat for monounsaturated fat, uh, increasing um, uh, glycemic index or, or, or fixed versus flexible dieting. And, and as noted, many of these trials are short in duration. Also discussed that there are zero randomized controlled trials on this rather popular diet at the moment, uh, despite its interesting data on the observational side. And despite the fact that it's existed for over 100 years, we know that this was actually utilized by Jocelyn and Allen, uh, prominent physicians at that time prior to the discovery of insulin. But what's more important than any of that, to me as a patient living with this disease and working at a research institute, uh, a clinical research institute, is that there's there's been a cited, uh, uh, how would I want to term this? Um, that, well, let me frame it this way. You know, the ADA came out with some guidelines around low carbohydrate and the very low carbohydrate eating, but these guidelines were very specific or much more specific to type two, not specific to type one. There is also cited evidence by um, Annalyn Conklin's group that the actual use of therapeutic carbohydrate restriction, that up to 66% of dietitians feel unprepared to actually implement such approach. So the lack of research in this domain has, lacked to a has led to a lack of guidelines or evidence-based guidelines, which has ultimately resulted in a number of publications illustrating actually over half of the publications in the very low carbohydrate end show that patients are actually doing this diet largely without healthcare support. So they're doing it on their own, which obviously creates a very unsafe dynamic uh, between the patient and the physician, uh, which ultimately needs to be addressed. And the, the way to address that is with research and evidence that allows for clinicians to feel supported on how to implement these approaches and how to do it safely. Yeah, I mean, we just, also know that um, just Andrew, and anecdotally, yeah. we've heard, I've heard many times from um, a T1D um, parent group that I, I ran for several years uh, that they're, that when people try to implement this for their kids, they do get a lot of pushback from physicians. Um, and, and there's a lot of misinformation and, and misunderstanding uh, at this juncture. It's a very uh, important one that you point out. 
Monica, Monica, I, I could not emphasize that more. Uh, it is at its core a major problem. If it, if these objective metrics of popularity are where they are, and patients are doing this at uh, probably at highest incidence use ever. And the fact that we don't have research greater than seven days of randomized controlled trials, although the observational data patients that we know are doing it and, and very motivated uh, settings where they have their, their very specific way of implementing these strategies, um, yes, yeah, it, it appears to be very effective in those domains. But how does a physician feel empowered to implement these? Because that's based on clinical guidelines. And in the absence of clinical guidelines around these therapies, because of the absence of this gold standard evidence of randomized controlled trials, we're really failing both sides of the equation, Monica, both the patient and the healthcare provider to be able to help the patient on their journey. And ultimately that needs to be addressed. And yeah, so, yeah it was some of the some of the messaging that comes from physicians as well is now that you have a pump, you can eat whatever you want which has sort of resulted in the literature with um, increases in levels of obesity in T1D kids. So that's yeah. kind of, I mean, that's an, that's an aside, and I'm sure you'll probably get to it, but <laughs> anyway. Yeah, it, it, you bring up a great point. The incidence of obesity and type 1 diabetes uh, used to be lower than the general population, but recent very large scale, uh, rigorously done epidemiological data illustrates that people with type 1 diabetes are now matching the general population. And we know that the general population incidence of overweight and obesity is not in a good spot. Uh, yeah. It's very, very high. Yeah. And ultimately, in type 1 diabetes, where you're administering exogenous insulin, the implications between nutrition, uh, exogenous insulin, and all these other factors, and, and patients are already at increased risk, you add obesity on top of that, and it's, uh, you know, one could argue it's like adding gasoline uh, on top of the, the this this issue. Um, and so, you know, on, on top of that, there was also a, a recent, um, I, you could almost call it a guidelines paper in the American Academy of Pediatrics, actually discussing this topic of, of and again, the focus is on diet in general, but this is really a discussion uh, using the example of low carbohydrate diets is kind of to illustrate where we stand on nutritional research in type 1 diabetes. And what this uh, guidelines paper illustrated is it recommended against children utilizing this dietary strategy and also brought up a lot of hypothesized, hypothesized risks that might come up related to this diet and, and heavily recommended um, physician oversight when doing these diets. Uh, and, and that's an important thing to bring up because when you actually go to this manuscript, um, it there there isn't a lot of actual publications from these various interventions cited in this manuscript. Uh, although I, you know, I, I suspect maybe they kept this in their in mind or maybe knew of these, uh, but they're not cited and they're not discussed. And that, that brings up an issue related to the field of nutrition in general, specifically in type one diabetes where nutrition may have maybe a much more potent impl impact on day-to-day -day management of this disease. That this, this is an important issue and, and argue, you know, I'm biased, uh, in this domain, obviously, because I'm a nutritional researcher, but I, I would argue that this is a is a clear gap that requires some serious, serious um, fixing. Now, we already discussed these issues one through three here, but as also discussed, we don't have evidence based guidelines, um, and you know there have been hypothesized risk related to diets. We don't have the evidence based guidelines. Healthcare professionals have been cited to feel unprepared to implement these diets. Um, ultimately illustrating some real clear gaps in the nutritional front that need to be addressed, uh, 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 not just one entity or one person doing it, but a, a team effort of the type 1 diabetes community, research community, helping address this. We also published a paper in, uh, on this JCI manuscript talking about many of the ways in which to go about trying to address many of these gaps, uh, talking about optimizing um, it with current technology. When you have type 1 diabetes, you, it, food is not the only intervention. Uh, insulin will always be a part of the equation. Uh, technology is an emergent part of the equation uh, and growing. And these are amazing tools that ultimately need to be understood how food interacts with them. Can we use them to optimize outcomes? Uh, we, we also lack a lot of mechanistic data on how food may interact with various components of disease or disease outcomes. And there's also a need to focus beyond just glycemia. While HbA1c is is argue, well, objectively the most potent uh, 
biomarker related to risk, long-term risk for things like cardiovascular disease and beyond, um, there are other factors uh, that extend beyond glycemic control uh, and glyce or cardiovascular function. The amount of insulin that someone's administering, because you administer insulin outside the body or through exogenous uh, means, it's a different physiology than when you have it endogenously going straight to the liver. Uh, and as a result, can lead to things like iatropic hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance. The diet can interact with things like bone mineral density, growth, thyroid function, uh, and beyond. And these are areas that require investigation, um, if for nothing else, to provide evidence for or against the use of any one diet uh, in the domain of type 1 diabetes. But I don't want to act like this is a simple task <laughs> by any means. And that we should just, you know, uh, get right to it. This is easy. It's not, you know, nutrition is complex. There are various ways to look at research in the context of nutrition. Things like looking at safety, which is a, a, a clear need across a number of diets, because while guidelines, um, that historical graph I illustrated, the original guidelines were in the 1960s and 70s, providing guidelines on uh, uh, the amount of carbohydrates or what diet you should consume in type 1 diabetes. But that was actually in the absence of safety, efficacy, or effectiveness data for those diets. It was based on general population norms and expectations that that is safe, despite the fact that type 1 diabetes is a very unique disease requiring very unique considerations where food plays a very important role in those considerations. But there's things like safety, efficacy, effectiveness. Effectiveness for some people between efficacy is slightly different, but effectiveness is truly testing in, uh, either surrogate clinical endpoints or real clinical endpoints, like let's say premature mortality or things like honeymoon extension. There's also behavioral research. You know, How does food interact with how uh, sustainability of a diet, the quality of life as a result of changing your nutritional strategy? Things like diabetes distress, food cravings, but we also know there's mechanistic considerations when you change what you eat. Food is arguably one of the most potent impacts on metabolism. And the emergent evidence over the last two decades has really illustrated that metabolism has a powerful role in health, disease, and also things like performance. And so when considering other components beyond just safety, efficacy, effectiveness, and behavioral components, there's also mechanistic components about how various aspects of changing diet, like let's say you change carbohydrate intake, that changes glucose load or insulin load. This also could change things like metabolic processes, glycolysis, lipolysis, beta oxidation, ketogenesis, and beyond. All of these have been cited to have individual implications uh, as well on physiology and potential outcomes in the context of type 1 diabetes. And when changing a diet, carbohydrate load, metabolic processes, you also clearly have changes in metabolites from the body, things like glucose, amino acids, free fatty acids, or even ketones which all independently appear to have energetic implications, but also signaling implications across oxidative stress, inflammation, senescence. Uh, there's also microbiotic implications and beyond. So nutritional research uh, is, is arguably very promising, but also very complex and, and something that requires additional, uh, I, I would argue here in this presentation is, is in desperate need of additional uh, uh, investigation from the entire research type one diabetes community. Across this list, although it's non-comprehensive, just my personal take uh, on this research or where we stand right now, um, there's a lot of gaps, but we're, we're, I'm happy to report that we're actually, as a team here, working to address a, a number of these issues right now, um, but it, well, it needs much more research, other groups and other individuals to get involved. But one other area that's a research gap is that there's limited data on patients' lived experience with food and diet strategies. Uh, a lot of times we, we just observe patients, but we don't ask them, how do they feel? What, you know, how does, how do things like, um, you know, food or diet actually uh, change the way that they feel? Or does it have any implication at all? Maybe it doesn't matter to them. May, you know, these are important observations to understand, but this is also a gap. And this is one thing that I actually uh, uh, want to put out to the community of people who are listening here or know anyone who is either a patient or a caregiver with type 1 diabetes. We are actually actively doing a survey uh, of the type 1 diabetes community, um, University of British Columbia, our group at Sanson Diabetes Research Institute, and the Institute for Personalized Therapeutic Nutrition, a non-for-profit, uh, trying to better understand how nutrition affects health and disease are actually surveying patients from this type 1 diabetes community. One, you know, I'm also a part of this as someone living with this disease, 
on their lived experience. And, and I encourage everyone to get involved in this uh, because if if we don't hear back from patients, we, we can't use that data to inform anything. So um, there's a link here on the right-hand side for those interested, but if, if it's not available here or you don't see this presentation, if you just go uh, to either Twitter, X, whatever you want to call it, I pinned a tweet at the very top uh, because JDRF was able to uh, share this research study. And uh, you can go to the very pinned tweet on my Twitter and find this link where you can participate if you have not already. And I encourage people to do that. Andrew, so is, in summary, is, is, yeah. Andrew, is this uh, survey shared on um, in places like Beyond Type 1 or um, even uh, the T1D Exchange, which are patient-facing communities? Uh, to my understanding, it is not right now, but if, you're, if you have any insights on, on how to maybe work with them to get more people aware of this study, I, I would love uh, any help um, to be able yeah. to do that. Yeah, so. we'll talk offline. Cool. Awesome. Thank you so much, Monica. And if anyone has suggestions, please feel free to reach out uh, on how to further extend this because we really want international feedback from the community um, to get objective data, not just say, hey, you know, we think this is what people do or what they don't do, but get real feedback from the community itself about how they feel about these topics. And it's one of the unique opportunities for patients to give their input and to get involved. So in summary, uh, the type 1 diabetes population glycemic control remains, uh, are, in my opinion, suboptimal. There's opportunities to further improve it. Uh, we want to get people, the ADA guidelines, to get people less than 7%. Um, and, you know, we know that only about a fourth of the population is actually achieving that. Uh, these appear to be largely unchanged, although, you know, this is despite uh, more advanced technology and more advanced use of this technology. Uh, and we, so that really brings a focus to, you know, other things like diet or dietary components. Uh, since it is uh, things like carbohydrates specifically in diet appear to be the most potent lifestyle factor on things like food postprandial glycemic control, at least acute glycemic control. And there's a lot of areas and gaps in the research in this topic that need to be answered. And future research, in my opinion, should consider all facets of nutritional components as its own therapy. You know, we often talk about pharmaceutical interventions or technology uh, and how it works, but, you know, Food has illustrated itself to be as potent or more potent than many medications can be in the context of health, disease, and performance. And in the context of type 1, it, it's clear that there will always be a symbiotic relationship between medications that require patients like, allow patients like me to live like insulin and technologies like CGMs, which allow me to monitor acutely how whatever I do in life is affecting my outcomes. The same thing needs to be done for nutritional research across safety, efficacy, effectiveness, and, and mechanistic insights on how these impact type 1 diabetes outcome, ultimately with the goal to actually determine how food is or is not a tool uh, in the toolbox for type 1 diabetes. And ultimately to address that, we need to look at this in, uh, from a research perspective uh, to really uncover uh, what what we can do, what's safe and what's not safe. If something's unsafe, can we fix that? Um, you know, about any one particular diet or any one particular strategy. So with that, I also want to say uh, a really important note, note here that, uh, you know, we're talking about the state of science and where we are, but I'm at a, a really cool opportunity to be at Samsung Diabetes Research Institute, one of the, actually the first place to synthesize and administer insulin in the United States. Uh, Dr. William Samsung actually did so in the basement of the building I'm standing in right now, which is really surreal as a patient living with type 1 diabetes. Um, but I have to acknowledge the team here who's pivotal uh, uh, to actually making any of which we're talking about here even possible. Uh, and the many collaborators that have been a, a part of the journey uh, historically and, and current, as well as the funding uh, sources that have helped us um, extend this journey in this domain and beyond, both present NIH, uh, Southern California Center for Latino Health, Department of Defense, as well as past uh, research funding. So with that, um, I'll end the slideshow and uh, see if anyone has any questions, but I appreciate everyone's time uh, here today. Thank you, Andrew. This is really such an important um, sort of shining a, uh, shining a light on such an important um, area that needs more, I would say more funding and more, more research. Um, and I would, I just wanted to um, ask, you know, 
How much research in the nutritional field is focused on sort of uh, the loss or decrease of somatostatin, amylin, and the pancreatic enzymes in context of type 1 diabetes? And does that ever intersect with your, um, you know, research? Yeah. And, and Monica, by the way, can you see me or is it still yes. sharing? I'm not sure. I actually see your la uh, desktop. Uh, Maybe okay, go me... back to the previous. Oh, yeah, that's great. Okay. I have these, I have these two screens. So um, those are really important questions. Uh, I'm unfamiliar with uh, really, uh, uh, I would say that I'm unfamiliar with a lot of evidence in this domain about the intersection between nutritional impacts and these key components. Although uh, obviously they're important things like and maybe other people are more familiar than I am. Uh, so if anyone is, please speak up. Um, but, uh, you know, that's actually a current part of the investigation we're looking at is key hormonal changes that uh, actually interact with diet. And we think maybe slightly adjusted or changed in the context of type 1 diabetes, which is a, obviously a key area of research to, to consider as well. Um, but most of the nutritional research to date uh, at least historically, way back in the day, has really focused. It's almost incremental with interest over time. So there's a lot of interest in um, very fixed dieting versus flexible dieting. Does that change very much or does it matter? Things like carbohydrate counting. Um, and then also just changing subtle things within the diet, you know, certain types of fat versus other types of fat. Uh, there has been a, a small but some number of studies directly comparing direct carbohydrate content. Um, but other hormonal changes, uh, the implication of that is very relevant to what we spoke about here today in the context of glycogen. There was one study of seven days, uh, Ray John, in 2017, um, that looked at some of these implications. Is there is there differences in the implication, the impact of something like glycogen um, or, or glucagon, sorry, not glycogen, uh, glucagon's ability to mobilize and release more glucose into the body is that impaired in something like low carbohydrate diets over short term or is it what's the implications long term we have no idea frankly and so um key question important area i'm unfamiliar with any data on that domain mm -hmm. yeah and we just recently spoke with colleen cutcliffe and others eric triplett um you know, she, colleen is um the ceo of pendulum therapeutics who's who are developing sort of bespoke my um you know, a microbiome uh, medications. And Eric Triplett, as you know, is at University of Florida. He's an expert in the microbiome, particularly in type one. And so, you know, as you, as you study the changes that nutrition could bring in context of type one diabetes, so interesting to think about what might shift in the microbiome as well. And like, there's so much interesting research to be done in this corner. For sure. And I don't, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, it's amazing. I mean, are you looking for postdocs? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'm, uh, you know, in, in my life, Monica, I'm looking to do anything and anything I can to improve outcomes with type 1 diabetes. It's a very personal journey for me. So uh, we're in a, a, a stage where we're actually doing a number of randomized controlled trials in, in people with diabetes, with nutrition, looking at, you know, at, at, uh, metrics of cardiometabolic outcomes. Um and I'm excited about that. I, I hope that that will bring new insights. But if someone is interested in these topics or areas, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, if nothing else, it could be a connection and an opportunity to, to expand the effort. Um, and I, I have also found that when looking at the type 1 diabetes community, specifically the research community, I, you know, I, I'm, this is just my subjective feedback, and I might be biased because I'm looking at this community so closely. But I, I don't know if there's another research field where more patients who have this disease go back into actually participating in the process as physicians, as clinicians, as researchers, um, I would agree or at some that. level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's impressive. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of the speakers, I actually looked through your list. It's amazing. Uh, all the amazing people you've had uh, here. The amount of people who I've seen you speak, you know, like uh, uh, Rehan Lau, you know, at Stanford, he's just the man, you know, uh, lived experience, uh, family members, um, just a true rock star in the context of type 1 IBs, but many people like that have been your speakers, and it's really cool um, to see to see that. Uh, although, uh, sorry for a tangent there, but it's just really cool to be a part of this community and, and what's been done. Thank you so much. Um, and I did, yeah. we had a couple of questions in here. I know I asked a few, yeah. a lot of accolades. Thank you. Great presentation. Um, 
but uh, somebody wanted to know what's the timeline of that survey and plans for future stages of follow up? Will survey results be published or um, I guess mineable by the community in some space? Oh, good question. Uh, the mineable component, that's a good question. We didn't go down that road yet. Uh, it is planned to be published for sure. Uh, uh, we want to make this completely public uh, when we find these results out and ultimately publish it, of course. So, um, and this is a collaboration with UBC, uh, University of British Columbia. So they're and actually the IRB is through their their site, and uh, we're collaborative with them. So, um, we are thinking that we, we want to hit a certain threshold and number. So obviously, the more value, the more people who participate, the better, of course. Um, but we have a minimum number we need to hit, and then uh, we're thinking that we might get to that point. Although it depends on the community's uh, engagement and efforts. But we're going to visit our numbers in the new year, early new year in January, and see where we stand. And if we're there, we'll uh, the plan would be to close it. But if not, uh, we want to uh, keep it moving. Uh, but nonetheless, it's an opportunity right now, especially up until the new year, to really move to get involved um, as much as possible. If you know anyone with type 1 diabetes, you yourself are a patient, or you know anyone who's a caregiver, uh, we want both uh, feed feedback from both. That sounds great. I'll send you an um, email offline to suggest some um, patient-facing um, portals. So uh, maybe there you go. do yeah. some outreach through them. And um, yeah, fantastic. Really great talk. Uh, really, sh again, shining a light on some areas of inquiry that need uh, more scientists and more data. Um, and uh, I think, uh, personally, I think it would be uh, just a huge benefit to the research community to have these data in hand. So thank you very much again. Uh, appreciate it and have a great rest of your day. I appreciate it to everyone here who is uh, able to participate. And thank you so much, Monica, for what you're doing here. It's, it's really impressive. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye-bye. All right. You too.